morning. Morning. Praise God. I hope everybody's doing well this morning. Uh, what I want to talk about today, I uh, talked on this a little bit on Wednesday, and this stemmed up from something that a friend of mine posted on a social media website, which I kind of disagree with his comments, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you why. I'm, I'm going to read what he posted, and I'm going to translate it verbatim. He said, God gives, but he also takes away. God has a purpose in everything. Be grateful for what he gives you, and also be grateful, grateful for what he takes away, because in the end, Everything has a divine purpose. The same way you cling onto things, learn to let go of them. When I read this, I don't think he was talking about God taking away your sadness, your sin, your anxiety, your fears. I think he's talking about when you have a blessing from God, he will also take it away if he wants to, which I think is, is an incorrect idea that people have of God because in my opinion, if he gives you something that is a blessing to then take it away, that's a little, uh, I don't know, sadistic. So when I read that, it, it, it took me back to, to this scripture, and I want to read it to you from the Amplified Bible. It's Romans 11, verses 25 through 32. It says, lest you be self-opinionated, wise in your own conceits, I do not want you to miss this hidden truth and mystery, brethren. A hardening and sensibility has temporarily befallen a part of Israel to last until the full number of the ingathering of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant, my agreement with them when I shall take away their sins. From this point of view of the gospel, good news, they, the Jews at present are enemies of God, which is for your advantage and benefit but from the point of view of God's choice of election, of divine selection, they are still the beloved dear to him for the sake of their forefathers. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. He never withdraws them when once they are given, and he does not change his mind about those to whom he gives his grace or to whom he sends his call. Just as you were once disobedient and rebellious toward God, but now have obtained his mercy through their disobedience. So they also now are being disobedient when you are receiving mercy, that they in turn may one day, through the mercy you are enjoying, also receive mercy, that they may share the mercy which has been shown to you through you as messengers of the gospel to them. For God has consigned and up all men to disobedience only that he may have mercy on them all alike. So, I don't know why people are so hung up on believing that whenever they're going through something in life, it's because God is putting them through that. People that have cancer, God didn't give them cancer. That's a result of the fallen world that we live in. When Adam and Eve made a choice of eating from the fruit of the tree of good and evil, this that we're experiencing right now is a result of that. You know, I've heard I've heard people say when they when they have some sort of illness or or, or something that is, is bothering them, they say, The Lord does not give us burdens that we cannot carry. He doesn't give you a burden. Jesus said Take my burden, you know? It, my, my yoke is easy. Is that how it goes? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
So whatever you're going through in, in life is a result of poor decisions that you made or what's been carrying over since Adam and Eve decided to disobey, uh, disobey God. You know, I was watching a TV show the other day and one of the characters was going through something and she was crying, she was talking to her mom and her mom said to her, well, you gotta remember this, honey, God created sin so he can show us his mercy. <laughs> I laughed so hard when I, when I heard that because I've seen that show like three or four times already and that's probably the first time that I actually pay attention to that line. No, that's not true. Right. So we have to keep in mind that God is a good God. He wants to bless us. He says so in his word. Mm -hmm. You know, he wants us to be prosperous. He wants us to be healthy. He wants us to be happy. That's why he did what he did. If he didn't love us, he, w if he wasn't a good God, why would he have sent his only son to die for us? That's the ultimate sacrifice. And if that doesn't prove to you what kind of God we serve, right. then you know nothing about him. Amen. So that's what I wanted to share this morning. Yeah. Anyone <coughs> has anything they want to share? Not really.
to remember Robert that God continues to give him the strength to yeah. get through his <coughs> month of June. Yes, Mark. still give us everything that you want us to have, Lord. And we come to you, Father, because we have been washed by the blood of the Lamb, Lord. We thank you for giving us your Son, Lord, so that we can be redeemed and be able to get to you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We lift up all of those that are in need because of sickness. We declare that your healing has taken place right now in our lives for financial breakthroughs Do not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you. I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, 
I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now solved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Thank you, Lord. Uh, Mark and Donnie, could you take the offering, please? <clears throat> Just give John a break. <laughs> Can you, say, can you say the blessing, Mark? Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just we bless you this morning as you bless us, Lord God, in all things. We just ask you to bless this offering and all that we give and financial blessing to be poured out, a window, Lord God, to be opened. And Lord God, we just ask you to use it for your glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Let's worship. Shared this with the worship team earlier. I'll just share it one more time because it's too good not to. Acts 16, 25, and this is where we're at in this place right now. <clears throat> and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prisons were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled, had been fled. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm, do thyself no harm, for we are here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and, before th and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and they shall be saved, and thy house. And I know some in here um, facing some situations right now, but as Paul and Silas were imprisoned, not only do we just praise and worship him and just love on the Lord, but those whom care about us, those who in our families, those in our lives that need to be set free, they will also be set free. Amen. Just as those, those cellmates that were in there that did not know the Lord, they were set free also. And not only that, the jailer was also saved. So those situations in your life, let them become a light to take away any of the darkness. So let's just worship and love on him like the Paul and Silas did, that we can glorify and magnify the name of Jesus, and that the Spirit of the Lord will just set freedom. Set freedom. Set freedom in this place.
Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.
knows you're coming Here in and going out. I am to say yes. that you're my God. Yes. In the all together love me. All together love me. All
place for my soul. I'll find rest and peace in you in the depth of your
Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. No matter what we do, Lord. No how many times I screw up through the day, Lord. You know, my spirit, I love you, Lord. You said you'd never leave us or forsake us, Lord. Dance with your bride in this place, Lord. Dance with your bride in this place, Lord. Court her this day, in this room right now, Lord Jesus.
This is the realm of your glory. This is the realm of your grace. And I can feel your mighty power. It's moving in this place. I can feel your mighty power, and it's moving in this place. Sing with the angels. speaking to someone right now. <clears throat> Just let it out. What the Lord's got on your heart right now. There's a wind going through this place right now. Lord is speaking to someone or someone's right now. Doesn't matter if you're nine or you're ninety. There's some ministering spirits here. And they brought their spiritual watering cans for those that are thirsty. They're refreshing, they're pouring out the water of the spirit into those that are thirsty, those that need refreshing, those that have felt dry and distant, who felt tired and weary and lonely. There's a refreshing that the spirit of the Lord has brought in his angels minister to those who call upon his name, bringing refreshing from his hand into your spirit. you said in Joel 2.28 and then again in Acts that in the last days that you would pour out your spirit.
dreams and visions from young and old, men's servants and maid servants. That we ask for bread and you would not give us a stone. Reveal, Lord. Yes, even the vision, even now, I see barrels the size of houses being dipped into the heavenly realm, the river between the two trees being poured out for the nations, for the house of his, uh, for his body, to restore the rivers that have run dry. that gives life to those who will just come and drink. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I know the Lord wants to speak through another person in here this morning. And because of things of the past, you don't think that you are worthy. <coughs> doesn't matter. He wiped our sins away. He doesn't even remember them anymore. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Forget the past because the Lord has forgotten the past. He wants to speak and work his kingdom through you. Through Jesus and what he had done on the cross, you are now worthy. You are entrusted with the kingdom. You are entrusted with the kingdom. It's not about those on the platform or those in high places. We're all the same in the sight of the Lord. There's no greater and no lesser. We're all called to be priests. Everyone in this room, just release what the Lord is putting in you right now. Not it will only free you, but it will free others. Ezekiel 47. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced the east. The water was flowing down from below the south end, of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. Then he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gate that faces toward the east. And behold, the water was trickling out on the south side. Going on eastward with the measuring line in his hand, the man measured a thousand cubits and then led me through the water and it was ankle deep. Again, he measured a thousand and led me through the water and it was knee deep. Again, he measured a thousand and led me through the water, and it was waist deep. Again, he measured a thousand, and it was the river that I could not pass through, for the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in, a river that could not be passed through. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? And he led me back to the bank of the river. As I went back, I saw on the bank of the river very many trees on the one side and on the other. And he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah and enters the sea. When the water flows into the sea, the water will become fresh. And wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live. And there will be very many fish. For this water goes there, that the waters of the sea may become fresh, so everything will live where the river goes. Fishermen will stand beside the sea from Engedi to Anagline, it will be a place for the spreading of nets. Its fish will be for very many kinds, like the fish of the great sea, but its swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They are to be left for salt. And on the banks, on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bed fruit fresh fresh fruit every month because the water for them flows from the sanctuary 
their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. into the river, surrender to the river. You and I will be one. I love you. I will carry you. I will sustain you. I will give you life.
several things that have been mentioned this morning. <laughs> Are uh, very revealing as to his word. How many believe the word of God? I mean, how many of you really, really, truly, no doubt, 100% in your mind that the word of God is true? Period. End of the story. Amen. Nothing can override it. Nothing can supersede it. The word of God is not a lie. God can't lie. Everything that happens through God matches to his word. Amen? Amen. Absolutely 100%. And in this message this morning, that's where I wonder sometimes where people get confused is, is, is that... I mean, first of all, you have to have, I guess, a love for the word in order for God to, as he reveals himself to you, and I, I say you, I, to the world, it's still up to us to believe it or not. He doesn't force us to do anything, amen? He does not force himself upon you in a way that, you know, you're like a robot, so he's going to program you to think and talk and act a certain way. Praise God. We're, it's, it's not how it works. But he is forever there. Uh, presenting himself to us. Amen? Amen. But in Psalms 130, it says this. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. And I imagine when this psalmist wrote this down, imagine, just try to imagine the, uh, uh, the emotion that he is feeling. Because I don't think the uh, punctuation marks and everything else that goes into this is just there for happen chance. And think, okay, well, Lord... You know, out of the depths I cried for thee, you know, and that's just, you know. No, out of the depths I have cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. I wait for thee, Lord. My soul does wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say, more than they watch that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Amen? Amen. I want to read this from the message translation. Help God. The bottom has fallen out of my life. Master, hear my cry for help. Listen hard. Open your ears. Listen to my cries for mercy. If you, God, kept records on wrongdoings, who would stand a chance? As it turns out, forgiveness is your habit, and that's why you're worshipped. I pray to God, my life of prayer, and wait for what he'll say and do. My life's on the line before God, my Lord, waiting and watching till morning. Waiting and watching till morning. O Israel, wait and watch for God. With God's arrival comes love. And, God's, and with God's arrival comes generous redemption. No doubt about it, he'll redeem Israel, buy back Israel from captivity to sin. Hallelujah. Praise God. Is it true? Amen. How many of us from time to time are feeling what this psalmist is feeling. I mean, one thing's plainly obvious. Um, he's suffering, amen? He's in the midst of some hardship, some real difficulty. Anybody ever suffer any hardship or difficulty? Huh? Amen. And again, we've heard several times, if not tonight or this morning, uh, Wednesday night, it's uh, the world wonders. The world has to have someone to blame, right? So oftentimes, well, the easy thing to do is blame God, right? Well, do they blame God for the glory, for the good things that happen in their life? Eh, maybe they do, you know, but maybe not. But this, this psalm was uh, it's believed to be written during the, the Babylonian exile. The children of Israel were taken captive because of their idolatry, rebelling against God. Nebuchadnezzar destroyed their, uh, their temple. Um, and uh, it was a difficult time in the history of Israel. They were suffering under the cruel hand of an oppressor. He spoke in another language, and he worshipped another god. Imagine being under that rule. Biblical world te uh, teaches that human suffering is a result of a sin-cursed world. Robert spoke about it earlier um, um, in, a, in a certain sense. 
yeah, this world, it's rocking and it's reeling. And it's under, not because God is waving his little magic wand and go, like people imagine. That's not a God that I serve, amen? It's a loving God, amen? It's a result of a fallen world. That's what it is. We were given the choice from the very beginning. That's the choice that was made. And so now, how many thousands of years later, we're still suffering under the same um, nonsense that goes on in the world. Praise God. Romans 8, Apostle Paul describes creation as, as groaning to be redeemed, to be renewed. Mankind is also groaning, amen, under the burden of sin and its consequences. As a senior citizen, uh, you can find where uh, Jacob, um, he stands before Pharaoh, summarized his life by saying this, Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been. To be human, we're all human, amen. Yeah? We're going to be troubled. We're going to experience some really serious trials in this life. Amen? It's a truth. I mean, all you got to do is watch the news. I mean, I just look at everything that's going on in the world. And people shake their heads. Some people don't understand and say, see, God's, God's doing this and God did that. And God did. It's, uh, it's still up to us to present. Um, to people in this world um, the truth of the matter. What they do with it is what they do with it. Amen? Um, did Jesus, I don't find anywhere where Jesus um, uh, uh, is recorded as, you know, when they came across people and he presented the gospel and then they walked on and they got, maybe the, the him and the disciples are in, um, you know, taking a break. It's like, I don't know if those people were listening to me. Do you think they believe me? Do you think they're going to respond? I, well, I hope they do. I don't see that. What I see is, is Jesus presenting the truth, only what his father ha has shown to him. Amen? And then you go on. And hopefully those people will respond. I mean, that's the hope. I'm not doing it just for the sake of doing it. And then say, well, God, see, I told somebody today about you, so... It's all good, right? No, we don't have that same attitude either. But, you know, we, uh, uh, we all suffer from hard times and can weigh heavy. And those people that are out there that don't understand what it is to have hope in him, I mean, imagine, imagine. I can't. I think back before I knew God. I, I, you know, I wonder how I made it through the hard times. Maybe I was just too dumb and stupid to, uh, to really get it or, or give a rip. But nevertheless, I do know now that we do have hope. Amen? So sometimes hear the phrase, down in the dumps. Ever been down in the dumps? Huh? Sure you have. There are days when we are also, we're up in the clouds. Amen? It's like, woohoo, this is awesome. God is so good. And it's not like when I'm down in the dumps, I'm like, man, God, if he was here, I'd punch him right. No, I'm not doing that, but we do get down in the dumps. It's natural. We still have this, right? The flesh. Praise God. The psalmist begins this psalm by saying, Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. The phrase, out of the depths, it's an expression that describes a very, very low point in life. A time of extreme distress and trouble. Again, from the Message Bible. He says, help God, the bottom has fallen out of my life. But I don't think for one minute that this psalm is a down in the dumps message. Not at all. Actually, I would call it an on the way up message. Praise God. The true measure of life is, isn't about what comes our way. It's about how we respond to what comes our way. Now, this message that I'm talking about right now has been preached I don't know how many different ways and in, with different scripture, with different people, um, and see, that's the beauty of the word of God because it matches from word one to the last word in Revelation. It's a perfect match. It never contradicts itself, right? The word of God is, in fact, true. And in this, this passage in Psalms 130, it um, teaches us a very vital lesson as he cries out. We're all good with the fact that our sin's been dealt with, right? 
So there's going to be a few things that, that I mention in here. Now, obviously this message is, uh, the, the, the text from the message is, is Old Testament. It's a psalm written however long ago it was. So there's going to be several things that I'm going to talk about because I think in here there's like, there's a few steps that, that we can take that helps us to be able to climb up from times when we are in despair so that we don't have to ever be there because the more that we do this, the more that we get his grace ingrained in our hearts, in our minds, the more, uh, the less that we'll have to deal with the uh, garbage of the flesh. Yes, we walk in the flesh, but go back to what Paul said. He says, uh, what are we supposed to do? Walk in the spirit. Don't walk in the flesh. The more you walk in the spirit, the less you walk in the flesh. Does that mean that you're going to be perfect? Yes, you are perfect in Jesus Christ. Don't misunderstand that. It's already been done. It's been taken care of. Amen? Amen. Nothing is left undone. He said it was finished. It's finished. Praise God. Now, we're still here. Don't don't try to think that I'm trying to uh, gloss over something and and, uh, make it something that it's not. But we can easily fall into the trap to always and continue to fall back into the point to think that, yeah, but I... I'm not good enough. Look what I did yesterday. Look what I said. Look how I treated. Look what, look at, look, yeah, look at it. Fine. But again, help me, God. Help me, O oh Lord. And will he not help you? It's still up to us to receive the help. Amen? It really is. This psalmist speaks as it is, not as it might be. Read it over and over again. It's not something that he's hoping is going to take place. He's speaking as if it's a matter of fact, because it is a matter of fact. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. So rather than drown in self-pity, it's easy to do, right? The flesh. That's what the flesh wants to do. It wants to drag you down, keep you down, and then that's where the enemy comes in. How easy is it for the devil to beat up on the flesh? Right? It's a piece of cake. And then when we're down and we stay down, when we don't need to be, don't get me wrong. I suffer from being down in the dumps just like anybody else. But this encourages me that I don't have to spend another minute there. Hope has been defined as to look forward with confidence and with expectation, knowing that it's going to take place. My hope in Christ is real. Your hope in Christ is real as well. Amen? Apart from God, this world is a very hopeless place. Amen? Mm -hmm. Absolutely hopeless. But with God? (laughs) The psalm begins and ends with God. In verse 1, he cries out to the Lord with confident expectation of hope. And then in verse uh, 7, he says, let Israel hope in the Lord. When we choose God, we choose hope. Amen? When we turn to God, we turn to hope. What we expect from God is going to have a critical, very critical effect on how we respond to this life and the hard times that we're going to come up against. And don't think that it's ever going to stop. Because a lot of people that think they look at, you know, us as Christians and say, oh, just dumb, how dumb they are. They just, they're too stupid to know that you know, bad stuff's going to happen to them. And then they walk around with a smile on their face. Well, I would rather have the expectation of joy, of hope, of my redemption in him than rather than walk around in this life with, uh, I want to make sure everybody knows that I'm not having a good time. You know, we can say, well, what kind of a witness is that? It's not a matter of pointing fingers. It's a matter of just responding to what the word of God says because it's there for a reason. This psalm is recorded for us. It's there for a reason, just like every other word is. Amen? Amen. So in this, in this psalm, I think we're given uh, a few steps uh, that help us to get up and out of, out of despair, and it's fueled by hope for hard times. First one is pray. What's he doing, first of all? He's praying. Amen? Prayer is very important in our lives. Um, it, it's, it's crucial in our lives. Out of the depths, he says, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to my voice, my supplications. Little boy was saying his prayers at bedtime, and he prayed, Lord, bless Mommy and Daddy. And then, really loud, he would shout, and God, give me a new bicycle! <laughs> Alarm. 
alarmed, his mother pops in the room and, and says, son, don't pray so loud. God is not deaf. And he said, yeah, I know, but grandma's in the next room and she is. All right, that was okay. <laughs> but it's true. I've heard pastors say it many times. You've seen, you know, the preacher, and God is going to praise, he's going to relieve you, and he's going to do. I, I mean, yeah, people get fired up. I get it. I've done it. And, uh, you know, I don't think that everybody that does this is for sensationalism, but, you know, you see it. I mean, I don't have to scream and yell at somebody or God to get my point across. Amen? He is there. He is there. The psalmist realizes he needs help. We all need help. Amen? So if he's ever to escape from his trouble and despair, I think he's come to the right place. Amen? And that's where we all need to be. It's not self-help. I, I can't, you know, and, and please, again, don't misunderstand me. This kind of help I'm not going to get from my friend. I'm not going to get from Grandma. I'm not going to get it from Dr. Phil. All those things are good. I've gotten help. Okay, not from Dr. Phil, but from my grandma, from a friend, right? I've gotten help in those places, but this kind of help, there's only one place to go. There's only one that can give it, and that's God. Amen? Amen. We can all be guilty of looking to the wrong people, the wrong places, for solutions to our problems, but, um, I mean, it's plain and simple. He cries out for the Lord. Amen? When life gets hard, remember, prayer, not despair. There's an old pastor that he spoke of his days as a young preacher in Louisiana during the Depression, and electricity was just coming into that part of the country, and they're out in a rural church, and there's just this one little light hanging in the middle of the church. That was it. So he's preaching away, and in the middle of the sermon, all of a sudden, lights went out building went pinch black. He didn't know what to say. You know, he said he's a young preacher. He stumbled around, and one of the elderly deacons was sitting in the back, and he said, preach on, preacher. We can still see Jesus in the dark. <laughs> Amen? Sometimes that's the only place we can see Jesus is when it's dark. Think about the world. Think about people that don't believe. Um, there's, there's a joke about an atheist. I, I can't remember it right now, but... Um, you know, a lot of times I'll hear people that, you know, I don't know their real walk with God, but we've all, you know, we can relate to this. You'll hear people that'll say, oh, Jesus, oh, God, and they ain't never, they can't even spell God, right? But who's the first person they call out to? How about us? They're out on the outskirts, and they, it's like, yeah, I want to believe, but I can't believe, but they know you. And who's the first person they come to when something, uh, when they need prayer in their life, when someone uh, in their family, uh, a friend, whatever that it is, but more specifically in their life, who's the first person they come to? You. So don't tell me that, you know, going back to, I can't, don't tell me that I can't live my life like I'm Jesus. That's what we're supposed to do, isn't it? That's what the word says that I am able to do, that I can to. Again, don't get me wrong, I'm not Jesus, okay? But. He says that I can do all the things that he did, and what? Everybody knows this. Okay, everybody here knows this. But how many times do we get stuck in a rut, stuck in a spot where we lose sight of that? It's natural. We have flesh. But the more that we deal with it, right? I mean, right now, right on the spot, don't let it linger, the better off we're going to be, amen? And the better off those around us are going to be. Thank you, Jesus. Luke 18 and 1, Jesus said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. We know that Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, he prayed and uh, he went out, found, he says, all right, you guys just wait here. Just pray. That's all. That's all you got to do is pray. I'll be back. Comes back. What's he find? <laughs> Sleeping. It's like, all right, come on. But, you know, Jesus knew what he was, what he was up against. He knew what he was facing. Amen. This is nothing new. He was going to have to drink that awful, nasty, bitter cup of God's wrath hanging upon the cross for you, for me, for the world. I think sometimes we think we're more privileged than those that aren't here sitting in these pews worshiping God because we are here worshiping God and all oh, those poor souls. He died for every single one of us. Every single one of us. 
And it's easy to fall into that. Oh, those, those poor people. But see, this is where he, what did he do? When he ascended unto, up into heaven, Jesus said, I'm leaving it in your hands. It's in your hands now. Take this message. Take this power. Take what you have seen me do and take it to the world so that they know they do not have to live in despair. They do not have to live down in the dumps. Amen? Jesus prayed. Our greatest example. Amen? So in hard times, just pray and don't faint. Number two, confess and proclaim. We heard confession and proclamation this morning. Okay, so here's one of those words where um, people maybe get a, feel a little squirrely when I mention the word confess. Um, confess isn't a, a bad thing. Because the, the understanding is, is that, okay, for someone who hasn't come to the Lord, hasn't repented, I'm not talking about repentance, I'm talking about confession and proclamation here. Okay, so we, as, as, as we all know somebody that hasn't um, necessarily in our minds, thank, repented and come to God and said, I receive you, Lord, as my, uh, my Lord and Savior, right? So we wish for that, that those people would do it. So I repent of my sins. Okay, here we see that confessing and proclaiming, so we expect God to be forgiving, amen? We expect God to not be condemning because that's what the word says. But for still, a lot of us, it's still hard to just totally be on board with it and through the word of God, and not just because Pastor Hamlin's been doing it, and thank God for it, because we got, I believe, one of the, the greatest minds uh, around as far as uh, diving in and, and understanding and, and bringing forth the message of grace and exactly the way that God lays it out. Amen? But, um, so it's not just because he's doing it, but it is because he has opened up his heart and his mind. Can I, can I not do the same thing? Can you not do the same exact thing? And that's a, I believe that's a huge part of his heart as well. It's, it's not like he's, you know, looking for, hey, that was a great message, man. Here's my back. Go ahead and pat it. <laughs> right? That's not what it's about. It's about presenting the word of God. The psalmist continues in verse 3 and 4. If thou, Lord, should markest uh, iniquities... O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. Uh, again, three and four. Um, let me go back to... Uh, if you, God, kept records on wrongdoings, who would stand a chance? This is Old Testament, right? And he says it again. This is from the Message Bible. If you, God, kept records of wrongdoings, who would stand a chance? Nobody. Nobody. That's his point. He's speaking matter-of-factly. As it turns out, forgiveness is your habit, and that's why you're worshipped. I think one of the reasons why you're worshipped. It's easy to worship a God that is there to forgive us. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Augustine wrote the words of verse 4 in the wall room where he was dying. Facing death, reading those words. How about even facing death? Praise God. If, if I know that I have no record of wrongdoing with a God that is going, you know, we picture God sitting at a, at a like a judge, right, at the seat, and uh, he's got his gavel in one hand, and, and a lot of people still think they're going to walk up the aisle, and he's going to look at you and say, guilty, and off the hell you go. That's not the word that I read. Now, don't get me wrong, I used to worry about it daily. Even still, you know, preaching the word of God. I used to, it's like, I mean, heart palpitations, you know, because it's, that's not, that's just not it. It's been done, it's been taken care of. Now, does that again, I know we keep saying the same things over and over again, so now I can just whip out my license. Yeah, but see, I got a license, I can do whatever I want. It's right here. Right? It's not, that's not it either. There's a balance. And the balance is this. Accept the fact that you've been dealt with. 
It's done. It's over with. And we can live freely, uh, obviously according to his, his will, his word. So in doing that, in walking in the spirit, are you not going to want to do the right thing? Naturally, in the spirit. Now your flesh is still over here tripping and bumbling and stumbling over itself. But it's been dealt with. Do we really believe that? Do we understand that? I hope so. So we know in, in verse 3, God, uh, he reveals that God does not delight. He does not make a list of our sins. Then focus on that list. It is if thou, Lord, shouldest mark winning, who could stand? If God was of this disposition, who could stand before him? John tells us, and we've heard it this morning again, what is God? God is love. He loved us so much that he came down to earth in flesh and had that flesh nailed to a tree so that we would have a chance, that we stand a chance to be set free and make heaven our home in eternity. Amen? That's a fact. Look in Corinthians 13. Paul tells us that love, it thinks no evil. That is, love does not keep a list of offenses. It does not store up a memory of offenses. Instead, our God desires to forgive, and he does. He has. Amen? So this confessing part, confessing is proclaiming. I proclaim that my finances are going to be free. I proclaim that my healing is already done and taken place, and now I'm going to bring my flesh under that same thought, that same process, so that it accepts the healing that's already taken place. Confess it. I know at one point it says confess your sins one to another. Why? Because there's what? There's forgiveness, right? God forgives us. God is not eager to condemn. He forgives. Think about the prodigal son. Everybody knows the story. He goes off. He does his own thing. When he comes back home, what does the father do? Whip out his notebook and say, well, first of all, you did this. You... No. He whips up a big old party. And they party down. Awesome. That's what our Father in Heaven does. Amen? So obviously, coming to God for the first time, there has to be repentance, amen, in order to be forgiven, to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, right? Everybody understands that. So when we confess, then, the confession is, is for us. Because I know when I do something stupid, I say something stupid, I, whatever that it is. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying not to keep a list anymore either because God doesn't. But I know it's like almost, it, it's just second nature. I mean, oh, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I did not mean to say that. It's like, a, is there anything wrong with that? Is there anything wrong with that? I know one thing for sure. It makes this flesh feel a whole lot better. It, it gives me, it provides some relief in, in my mind. My mind, the sarks, is flesh as well. Just what you can see here. My mind is flesh. Absolutely. And my mind thinks, does, says, acts out on some really stupid things. But he is there to forgive me. Amen. David says this in Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Not whose sin might be taken care of, whose sin could maybe be dealt with later. It's covered. He continues, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. As if God doesn't know anyway, right? So just tell God what he already knows. Right? Feel better about yourself in the flesh. That's what this means in confession. But also proclaiming, confess the truth about your need. Confess openly. Proclaim your healing. Do you proclaim your healing? Do you proclaim your deliverance? Or are you still kind of, I, I don't know, I know me, and it's like, I don't know, God's really busy with some other people. There's other people that mean more to, to him than I do. I'm just me. I mean, you know, is that the way we think? Or do we think that when I proclaim it, it's going to take place? It's going to be done in the name of Jesus. Do we? Do we have that mindset? Or is there little increments of doubt in there? I don't know. That's something that we all have to decide for ourselves. 
He has already set us free. And again, it's just a matter of getting this flesh to come along for the ride. Because it's there anyway, right? You're going to drag this carcass around until the day that you die. So hopefully we can gain better understanding and knowing that as we drag this glob of flesh around, we don't have to live according to it. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Patiently wait. Expect God to move in his own time. Heard some great teaching on the timeline as far as God's concerned here recently. Pastor Hamlin taught on it. It was very, very good. He says this, the psalmist in verses 5 and 6, I wait for the Lord, my soul does wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. He's leaning forward and he's looking up. You know what it means to lean forward? Lean forward with expectations. I don't mean actually, you know, lean forward so you fall over. Lean forward in the spirit. Expect God is going to take care of whatever it is that you bring to him. Have that mindset. Don't lose sight of it. His expectations are set on the Lord himself. One good thing about it at a low point in our lives, the only way is, is to what? Look up. Just look up. Look up for your redemption draws nigh. Look up before your redemption is here. It's taken place, amen? My soul waits for the Lord. The word wait means more than standing still. Like, I'm just going to go over and say, now, you know, pastors pro- uh, preached on, uh, you know, waiting and uh, entering into his rest. So I'm going to go over here, and I'm just going to sit in the corner, and I'm not going to do anything else, but I'm just going to just sit here and wait. Is that what he means? In a sense, yes, but the only action that we really need to take is just talk to him. Just talk to him. Hey, Robert, how's it going? God, how's it going today? My life is uh, it's in the pits, Lord. I need a financial blessing. Hey, Robert, my life's in the pits. I need a financial blessing. What do you got to say? Hmm. Do we not think God is going to respond to us? And that's why we don't take the time? He doesn't mean go sit and wait in the corner with your hand out. (laughs) Praise God. The action that we take in this is that we're waiting in hope, amen? Amen. We're waiting with an expectation, a joy. And the more that we do that, the the rotten crap that happens in this life is going to be less significant each and every time that it comes against you. It's not resignation. It's not collapse. Waiting has with what we can do right now, doing what we can. We wait in hope, and we look for the morning of his return. Amen? Amen. One thing we can do while we wait is read the Word. The Word's truth. Um, used to get beat up all the time. You reading your Word? I guarantee you ain't reading the Bible not enough. How many scriptures you got memorized? It's not what it's about. It's about just reading in His Word. Crack it open. Find, find the joy that's there. But a lot of times, He reveals us, right? He reveals us in His Word. And uh, we're, we're nothing but, what, rotten, dirty scoundrels. That's what we are in the flesh, but in the spirit, to realize that, to understand that this isn't what you see, who I am, it's just not. Like I said before, God showed me uh, for Jody that one, one morning, look in the mirror, what do you see? Do, you, do I see this, or do I see the creation that God has done in my life? Do I see Jesus? That's who I need to see, amen? And the more that I see him, The more I see him working in my life, able to work through other people's lives, come on, there's there's joy. There's relief. 2 Timothy 1 and 7 says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Hmm. So that almost contradicts what I said earlier. My mind, which if you read in, in the New Testament... The Greek is sarx, which is flesh, right? But if my whole entire being, this flesh can be renewed in the spirit, that means my mind can be renewed in the spirit. So that's where it's, you know, you read Paul. I mean, you know, 
walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. I do the things that I don't want to do. I don't do the things that I want to do. And it's just like, you know, we all do this. But the point to it is, is you keep coming back to Jesus. And the more quickly that you do that, each and every time, the less this, this stuff is going to bother us and, 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 and latch on to us and, and stay there. So the last step is to believe. Expect God to respond in love. The wrath of God has been poured out. It was poured out upon Jesus so that we wouldn't have to, because we couldn't. No way we could take it. No way we could deal with that. So he dealt with us for us. How awesome is that? So to believe, well, what do you believe? What is it that you believe? Do you believe that the word of God is true and what it's telling you is the truth? Whether you believe in me or not is irrelevant. What you need to believe is the word of God. Romans uh, 3, let the word of God be true and every man a liar. Every man has the, the ability and the power to lie right through his teeth to us, to feed us some false message so that we'll go down a different path. But God does not condemn. God's word also says that there is therefore now no condemnation to them that believe. Believe what? I mean, I try to boil it down in simplest terms. That God came in the flesh, was crucified for every single one of us so that we didn't have to suffer from guilt from the things that happen in this flesh. Plain and simple. I just, people put way too much into um, believing because they think, well, I mean, my God, look how big this is. There's so much stuff in there. How can I possibly know what to, how to, where to start, what to, well, the more that we um, um, incline ourselves to him, the better off we're going to be, obviously, but I believe that revelation obviously is important in every one of our lives. I would love for a friend of mine, to come to the full knowledge of Christ and just to receive him and to get on with his life. But all I can do is present him to him. It's still up to him what to do with it. Amen? So what does he believe? Well, that's up to him, just like it is, it is up to us. I want to read, uh, close with this. I'm going to read Romans chapter 8 from the Message Bible. Church, it's really simple. Pray, confess, and proclaim, right? We understand what that means. Look up, lean forward with just, I mean, unwavering expectation that it's going to take place, amen? And truly believe in a, a, a bright now. Not just a bright future, but a bright right now, amen? amen. Listen to this. It starts out, and it's, the caption is, the solution is life on God's terms. With the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, that fateful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter unto Christ being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous, low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. God went for the juggler when he, went, when he sent his own son. He didn't deal with the problem as something remote and unimportant, unimportant. His son, Jesus, he personally took on the human condition, entered the disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. The law code, weakened as it always was by fractured human nature, could never have done that. The law always ended up being used as a band-aid on sin, on sin instead of a deep healing of it. And now what the law code asked for, but we couldn't deliver, is accomplished as we, instead of rebuilding our own efforts, simply embrace what the Spirit is doing in us. Those who think they can do it on their own end up obsessed and measuring their own moral muscle, but never get around to exercising it in real life. Those who trust God's action in them find that God's Spirit is in them, living and breathing God. Obs uh, I'm sorry. Uh, obsession with self in these matters is a dead end. Attention to God leads us out into the open, into a spacious, free life. Focusing on the self is the opposite of focusing on God. 
Anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God, ends up thinking more about self than God. That person ignores who God is and what he is doing, and God isn't pleased at being ignored. But if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than of him. Anyone, of course, who has not welcomed that invisible but clearly present God, the Spirit of Christ, won't have a clue what we're talking about. But for you who welcome him, in whom he dwells, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that if uh, the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you, and he does, as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life with his spirit living in you. Your body will be as alive as Christ's. So don't you see that we don't owe this old do-it-yourself life one red cent. There's nothing in it for us. Nothing at all. The best thing to do is give it a decent burial. Huh? Give it a decent burial and get on with your new life. Get on with your new life. God's spirit beckons. There are things to do and places to go. This resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant. Huh? We expect it. Greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? God's spirit touches our spirit, uh, spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who he is and we know who we are. Father and children. And we know we are going to get what's coming to us. An unbelievable inheritance. Huh? That's pretty good. So, you know, as things come against us, and they will, just remember your inheritance. Just remember your inheritance. Pray. Lean forward with expectation. Just receive it. Expect it, right? Believe. Continue to believe. Don't think for a minute I'm, I'm trying to make any, like I doubt anyone's belief. But as things come against us, the more that we believe that this word is absolutely 100% true, then how can I be down in the dumps? Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I truly thank you for your word. It's simplicity, Lord God, that even I can understand, Lord Jesus, the things that I do at this point. I just pray for continued revelation that as your spirit rests on each and every one of us, that as we go out into this world, that's who people see. It's you. It's Jesus. It is not us. It's not about us. It never has been about us, and it's not going to be about us. It's about you, Lord. And that presentation that people see, there is no doubt in my mind 100% that as I live my life and all of the stuff that comes against me, I know that in you, I am already free from it. And the people of this world that are lost and dying in this generation that don't know you, I pray, Lord God, that revelation is poured out in giant barrels into the river and that they all jump into it. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Everybody have a supernatural week. God is good. He remains good, and he will always be good. Amen? amen. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus.